Laura, how are you? Good, thank you. Iris, uh, I think, is there. Hi, Iris. And hi, Iris. Hey, everyone. Everyone's there. Hello. Okay, streaming let's okay. start. Yes. Perfect. All streaming and share the video. Perfect. So I will leave you to it. Perfect. Anything happens? Yes, don't worry, but I, I will restart. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, so uh, just to recap a little bit what we saw in the last class, we were saying that in the Goodwin section, uh, we have uh, the flutes, the oboes, the clarinets, the bassoons, and the saxophones. And those are the principal instruments, the, the standard instruments. And then we have what we call auxiliary instruments. Um, and when, for, for example, in the flute family, uh, the piccolo is an auxiliary instrument, or the alto flute is an auxiliary instrument. Uh, for example, in the oboe family, the English horn is an auxiliary instrument. So auxiliary instruments are the ones that are not the, the most common, the standard, let's say. Uh, and remember that in the in the woodwind section, uh, there are a lot of transposing instruments. So we have to keep in mind, we have to remember uh, which are the transposing instruments and uh, what interval they transpose. You have to remember, for example, that the alto flute uh, transposes a, a perfect fourth, or that uh, the standard clarinet is a B flat clarinet, so uh, it is it sounds a major second lower than written. Uh, well, all the saxophones, uh, all the sorry, all the clarinets are uh, transposing instruments. Um, the alto flute, the English horn, and also the, the contrabassoon that uh, we will see today. Today we will see the clarinets, uh, the bassoon, the contrabassoon, uh, and the saxophones. And if we have enough time, uh, we can see a little bit of, uh, of tonguing and articulation. Um, So, give me just a second. Um, okay, here, the clarinet. Uh, well, let's recap a little bit the part of the clarinet. Um, this is called the bell because it resembles uh, to a bell. Uh, this part is called uh, the lower section. Uh, some people also call it the lower tube. Uh, this is the upper tube or the upper section. And then this little piece uh, here is called um, the barrel because it resembles to a barrel. And uh, this is the mouthpiece. Remember that the clarinet is a single reed instrument. Um, so uh, here we have the mouthpiece uh, with the ligature and the, and the reed. Uh, well, we saw this uh, the last class, but we can refresh a little bit uh, the main features of the clarinet are that all clarinets are written in treble clef. Uh, also, the the bass clarinet that is a, a low pitched instrument is written in treble clef. <clears throat> uh, another feature is that all clarinets have the same fingering system, uh, so uh, one player uh, only have to learn one set 
of fingerings and uh, once he has learned learned it he can play all the other members of the family um this one, the third point, is that all clarinets are transposing instruments. Uh, now, in a few minutes, we will see the, the different transpositions of each clarinet. And, uh, well, you have to remember that here, I mean the last point, the B-flat clarinet sounds a major second lower than written. Um, Okay, <clears throat> so here we have an example. Uh, if we see, if a clarinet player uh, sees this written passage, uh, it will sound a major second lower. So it uh, will sound this uh, in B flat major. So each note is a uh, a major second uh, lower than written. Now let's see the range. Just let me see something. Okay. Uh, well, this is the written range of the clarinet. The lowest uh, note is E3 of the written range, uh, and uh, it goes up to a A6. So it is a very wide range. It is uh, almost uh, three octaves and a half. So uh, it is a wide range. Um, and then the sounding range is, uh, is the same as this, but um, a major second lower. So uh, if, the, if the clarinetist sees uh, this note, uh, it will sound this one. And if he sees this A6, it sounds a major second lower, so a G6. Um, okay, now let's see the registral characteristics in the clarinet. Each uh, register of the instrument have a particular name. Uh, let's see that. Uh, the lower register uh, is called the Shalomo register. Um, well, it, it is uh, deep and rich, and it sounds uh, it sounds really good. And there are a uh, a lot of orchestral passages using this this register. Uh, you can use it, and it sounds uh, perfectly good. Uh, and well, it is called the Shalomo register because um, uh, there was a, an instrument. The Shalomo was an instrument that was a predecessor of the clarinet, uh, and so that's why the we call this register the Shalomor register uh, because it was the name of the predecessor of the clarinet. Um, then uh, all the chromatic pitches that are uh, between uh, this G4 and E flat 4, uh, so G4, C sharp 4, A4, and B flat 4, uh, they are called throat tones, and they sound uh, a little bit pale. Um, it is a very particular sound. Um, the, we call them throat tones, but it has not, nothing to do with the human throat. Uh, it is related to the, the throat, let's say, of the clarinet, because the, the air is escaping through the through the upper part of the clarinet, uh, that's why they they sound like they have like a pale sound. Um, then the next register has also a particular name. 
we call it the Clarino register uh, because the, the Clarino was a, a trumpet uh, that it was used in the in the Middle Ages and uh, in the Renaissance. And some people say that this register of the clarinet sounds uh, a little bit like that trumpet. Uh, well, actually, if you listen to this uh, to this register, it doesn't sound like a trumpet at all. But well, some people uh, called it the clarino register because they they say that it sounds similar to a to that uh, medieval trumpet. Um, well, and uh, in this register, it sounds bright uh, and expressive. Uh, the one uh, feature about the clarinet is that uh, you can play uh, loud dynamics and soft dynamics in all the different registers. So it is a very versatile instrument uh, and can do a lot of different articulations and dynamics uh, very well. And now, this uh, extreme high register uh, is shrill, so I recommend uh, that you don't use it. Mm, you don't use it very much. Uh, always in the woodwind instruments, uh, is uh, difficult to produce the the highest notes. <clears throat> and they usually <clears throat> don't sound uh, don't sound good. They sound shrill, and if they are if they are not used correctly, uh, they they are unpleasant. Uh, well, regarding uh, trills and tremolos, uh, the clarinet is a very great instrument uh, for performing trills. Um, so here we see that all trills and tremolos are possible, or at least, let's say, they can be negotiated. Um, so, uh, well, uh, you can do all the trills or all the tremolos, but you have to keep in mind that large interval tremolos are more difficult. In general, they are difficult, large interval tremolos. For example, uh, what we what we were studying uh, the last lesson, that octave tremolos are uh, extremely difficult. And uh, so uh, you don't have to do octave tremolos or major seven tremolos. Uh, and um, if they, if if the large interval tremolos are above the staff, is even more difficult. Uh, now uh, let's see the other member of the family, the the piccolo clarinet. Let's say that is the E flat clarinet. Um, this is a transposing instrument, and it sounds a minor third higher than written. Um, and well, it has the same fingering as the B flat clarinet. So uh, we can see that the written range is the same as the B flat clarinet, but uh, the sounding range uh, is different because it, uh, the transposition is different is a minor third higher than written. Uh, so uh, here you have the sounding range from uh, G3 uh, up to DC. Uh, now let's see the bass clarinet. The, this is the other auxiliary instrument of the family. Uh, remember that it is written in treble clef. Uh, and this instrument, the bass clarinet, is uh, in B flat. Uh, but uh, 
it doesn't sound uh, a major second lower, but it sounds a, a major ninth lower. So it is like a like a compound major second. Okay. Um, well, uh, the fingering is the same as the B flat clarinet, as the regular clarinet. Uh, so, if we see this written passage, it would sound here. Uh, so there you can see that the transposition is a, a, a major ninth. You can think of it as a major ninth or a compound major second. Uh, it's the same. Uh, and, and here we have the, the picture of the bass clarinet. Uh, uh, the parts are the same of that of the, of the clarinet. But it has this that is called a spike, this uh, stick here. Uh, and uh, the performers uh, use the spike uh, to, to put it uh, on the floor, to hold it on the floor. Um, now let's see the range. The range is uh, very, very similar to that of the uh, B flat clarinet. Uh, the only difference is that uh, it has one more, one more uh, lower note. Uh, so the lowest note of the of the bass clarinet is uh, this E flat, E flat three. Uh, and well, uh, it goes up to a, a E6. Uh, so uh, remember that the range, the written range is the same, but it has one more note. And so the sounding range is uh, actually really low uh, because it is it goes from this D flat uh, up to this D5. Uh, Um, sorry. Uh, now let's see the other family, the bassoon family. Remember that uh, the bassoon is a non-transposing instrument. Um, um, yeah, just remember that it is a non-transposing instrument. Um, Uh, well, the bassoon has a lot of different parts. Uh, it is important to see that the the bell is here, uh, and the crook. This is called the the crook is here, uh, and well, they are uh, inside the mouth. The player uh, has the um, the the double reed. Um, when the bassoon player uh, plays, uh, so uh, if, if they want to produce, uh, let's suppose the, the lowest uh, sound of the bassoon, uh, the player blows air. So uh, the, the path of the, that the air makes, it uh, goes through the crook, it goes all the way down. Then it changes the direction, it goes up and it exits here. So if uh, that is all the all the path that the air has to take when uh, you play the uh, the lowest note, it starts here, goes all the way down, all the way down, then all the way up, and it exits here. Uh, well. Uh, the bassoon is the, ba the bass voice of the wind section. Uh, let's suppose that uh, you want to orchestrate a, a chorale, 
uh, of Bach, for example, or the ones that you do in in, in harmonic exercises, um, where you have four voices, uh, the most common thing to do would be to use the flute for the soprano, the oboe for the alto, um, the clarinet for the tenor, and the bassoon for the bass. Uh, if we are using only uh, one member of each family, so we are not using the auxiliary instrument. Uh, if you want something more uh, homogeneous, uh, you can use uh, different members of the same family. For example, you can use uh, a, a B flat clarinet uh, or two B flat clarinets and um, a bass clarinet. Uh, so if you use a, a more members of the same family, it will sound more homogeneous. Uh, well, so the, the bassoon is the bass voice of the wind section. Uh, this instrument is notated in the bass clef, so remember that. And sometimes we can use the tenor clef if we want to avoid uh, a lot of letter lines. Uh, it's the same that uh, happens with the with the cello. You remember that in the cello, uh, we usually use the the bass clef. But sometimes, if we want to avoid letter lines, we can use the uh, the tenor clef. Um, and uh, well, uh, sometimes we think that uh, big instruments are not agile instrument, uh, and sometimes that is true. Uh, for example, the the tuba is not a very versatile or agile instrument. Um, it has some limitations, let's say. But in the case of the uh, bassoon, uh, it is a big instrument, but it is versatile and it is agile. So it can play uh, different dynamics, uh, a lot of different dynamics, and uh, it can play uh, uh, like long notes or, or very fast passages or staccato passages. Um, so keep in mind that the bassoon, although it is a big instrument, it is a uh, agile. Uh, here we see the range. It goes uh, from uh, B flat one to E flat five. So this one. Uh, the bassoon also has a very wide range. Uh, see that here we are using the, uh, the tenor clef. Uh, one famous passage uh, of the high register of the bassoon is the, the beginning, the, the first measures of the, uh, the right uh, of spring uh, of uh, Stravinsky. Uh, there he uses a he starts the, the, the work uh, with a bassoon in its highest register here. Uh, he begins the piece with a C5. So it is almost uh, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the highest register. Uh, well, uh, we saw that in the clarinet, we have different names for the different registers. Uh, in the bassoon, uh, there are no uh, specific names. Uh, so in the first register, let's call it first register. Uh, it, it sounds sonorous, uh, a little bit dark uh, and vibrant. So it is um, like a, uh, a sonorous sound. Uh, uh, you you can hear it. Uh, I mean, if the 
if there are some instruments playing and the, the bassoon is playing in this uh, register, it sounds uh, a little bit like with power and you will hear it. Uh, but it sounds great and you can use it. Um, well, this is like the most uh, most uh, common, let's say, uh, register of the bassoon. Uh, it sounds sweet and very, very expressive. Um, here, it sounds uh, a little bit thin. Uh, can you guys tell me, for example, uh, which note is this one? See that here we are using that uh, the tenor clef. E4. E4, yes, perfect. Uh, because remember that in this, the tenor clef, uh, the fourth line of the staff is um, C4, middle C. So uh, as Giorgio said, this one is uh, E4. Uh, and so this one is um, B flat 4. Uh, so here it sounds uh, thin, um, and well, as uh, all the other Goodwin instruments, the highest notes uh, sound like very thin, and they don't sound like really good. Well, now let's see the trills and tremolos. Um, trills are effective in in bassoon writing, so you can uh, use trills. Uh, but uh, let's say that there are uh, the the tremolos are more more problematic. Um, so we are here. They should never exceed a perfect fourth. Uh, so well, if you use tremolos in bassoon writing. Uh, you can use only uh, minor thirds or ma uh, major thirds. Uh, and here uh, we have the list of all the trills that uh, we cannot do in the bassoon. Uh, so they are, uh, there are a lot of different trills that we cannot produce, uh, but they are all in the, in the, in the lowest register. Uh, so here, for example, uh, is uh, this one, remember that is the, uh, the lowest uh, notes of the bassoon. Uh, it can be written as a B flat or A sharp. And so between A sharp and B, uh, sorry, uh, yes, A sharp and B. Uh, you cannot do a trill. The same with uh, B flat and C. Uh, B and C. And all these different uh, combinations. Now, the contrabassoon is a very, very low pitched instrument, uh, and it is the auxiliary instrument of the bassoon family. Uh, well, it is uh, the lowest of the woodwinds. Uh, it is a transposing instrument. Uh, it sounds one octave lower than written. It's like uh, uh, what happened with the, in the string section with the double bass that it is a transposing instrument, but it transposes one octave uh, lower. Well, the, the same happens with the contrabassoon. Uh, the, the techniques uh, are essentially the same. Also, the, the fingering are the same. Uh, but you have to keep this in mind. It is a very, very big instrument. 
the uh, if I'm not mistaken, the the tube of the contrabasson uh, is uh, five meters, uh, five meters long. Uh, but well, it is blended so that the player can can hold it in his hands. Um, so it is a very big instrument, and uh, you cannot play very fast staccato passages because the air takes a lot of time to go through the through the tube through the instrument. Uh, well, the range uh, is the same as the, the one we studied in the in the bassoon in the the bassoon. Uh, but uh, remember that it sounds one octave lower. So the lowest note that uh, that sounds on a bassoon is this one. Uh, so that is. B flat zero. So is the uh, if we look at the piano, is the lowest uh, B flat of the piano. Uh, and well, its uh, its lower note is this one, uh, uh, B flat three. So it goes from here up to here. Let's continue. Okay, now we start with the saxophone family. Um, I, I I play the alto saxophone, so if you have any any particular question about the the saxophones, uh, you can ask me, and I will try to to, to answer. Um, well, in the saxophone family, uh, these are the most common saxophones. Actually, there are a lot, a lot of different uh, saxophones that I am not including here, because they are more like experiments, let's say. Let's say. Uh, but the the saxophones that you will hear and see everywhere in 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 bands or in in orchestral music or in jazz uh, trios. Uh, are these ones the soprano saxophone that is in B flat, the alto saxophone that is in E flat, the tenor saxophone in B flat, like the soprano, and the baritone saxophone in E flat. So uh, it is important to notice that there is a pattern here. Uh, the first one is in B flat, the next one in E flat, the next one in B flat, the next one in E flat, and so. All the saxophones uh, always follow that pattern. Um, these instruments were created by a person uh, called uh, Adolf Sax. Sax was the surname of, the, of that person. Uh, so that's why we call it the saxophone. Um, and it was uh, invented uh, between uh, between 1840 and 1845, uh, at the beginning, uh, composers uh, or I mean classical composers uh, didn't include it in the in the in the orchestral works, and so it gained popularity with jazz and other genres. But some composers uh, in some of their of their orchestral works uh, include the saxophones. If you want to hear a very uh, good passage uh, where a composer uses the saxophone, is uh, pictures at an exhibition. Uh, that is a, a composition uh, that was composed by uh, Mussorgsky. Yeah. Mussorgsky, yes. Exactly, the, the Russian composer. Uh, but it was orchestrated, the whole piece was orchestrated by Ravel. Uh, and uh, he gave some some solos to uh, the saxophone. You can you can look for the uh, a piece that is called The Old Castle. 
and there you have a, an excellent uh, an excellent example of a saxophone solo. It is an alto saxophone in that piece. Um, well, so here is the soprano saxophone. Some people uh, confuse this instrument uh, with a clarinet, but actually they are different. The clarinet uh, is made of wood. They're made of a, a, a wood from, from Africa. It's called a uh, renadilla. Uh, some people just say uh, African black wood. Um, and the saxophone is uh, is not made of wood. Um, it's made out of uh, metal. Um, but uh, in appearance, they are kind of similar, let's say, because the soprano saxophone is uh, like straight. Uh, it is not a curved instrument. Although uh, it exists another version of the soprano saxophone that is curved, but uh, it is not uh, very popular. Um, so, well, this is a transposing instrument and it sounds a major second lower than written. So the transposition is exactly the same as the uh, B-flat clarinet. Uh, so if you write this passage in C major, it would sound in B-flat major. Also, remember that the saxophones are um, as uh, are a, a, a single reed instrument, like the clarinet. Uh, well, this is the alto saxophone. Uh, here, I I selected this picture so you can see the size of the instrument because some people uh, confuse the alto clarinet. Uh, sorry, the the alto saxophone with the tenor saxophone. Uh, in appearance, they are similar, but the alto saxophone is uh, a little bit smaller. Uh, so uh, look at the size of the instrument, uh, and then we'll see the tenor, and you'll see that it is a little bit uh, larger. Um, well, the alto saxophone, it is also a transposing instrument, so it sounds a major sixth lower than written. Uh, this transposition is, uh, I think, maybe the, the most difficult because a major six is a big interval. So it is, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit difficult to, to transpose a major six, uh, but, well, you you have to get used to it because that's the transposition of the alto saxophone. Um, so if you write here, Uh, this C, this is what the, the written passage. So what the what the players sees uh, on the score, and so if he plays, it sounds this a uh, major six lower. So instead of being a C five, it sounds a um, an E flat four. Uh, so uh, that's why uh, that that is the reason why we say the alto saxophone is an E flat uh, because uh, when the player sees a written C, it actually sounds a, a an E flat. Uh, Now here you can compare the size of the the sizes of the different instruments. This is the alto saxophone. Look at the size, uh, and this is the tenor saxophone. Here you can clearly see that it is a little bit bigger. Um, and well, the transposition of the tenor saxophone is the same as the. Uh, as a transposition of the bass clarinet. Uh, so you can think of it as a, 
a measure ninth lower than written or a compound measure second. Uh, again, so if we see this written, it would sound this. Uh, now, this is a baritone saxophone. Uh, here in the picture, you can see that uh, it is a, a big instrument and it has, uh, it is curved and it has all this like blend here. Um, well, um, it sounds a compound measure six lower than written. So uh, remember that the baritone saxophone is uh, in E flat. Uh, so it is like the alto saxophone, but you have to add a uh, one octave, one octave lower. So it is a compound measure six. Um, so there is a, a really big difference between the written range and the sounding range. Uh, if we see this, it sounds here. So here you can see that uh, this is a C4. Uh, and this is a major sixth lower uh, plus an octave. So a compound major six. Uh, okay, now <clears throat> we have seen all the instruments that make up the woodwind section. So now let's see in a few minutes the different playing techniques. This will be easy for you because we have already seen the different articulations in the string instruments. And uh, in, the, in the woodwind instruments, uh, the articulations are similar. We have to see some, uh, some particularities of the woodwind instruments. Uh, but well, this, uh, this will be easy to understand for you. Uh, sorry. Well, the vibrato, uh, we saw that uh, the, the string instruments, they always play with vibrato, uh, and the same happen with the woodwind instrument. Uh, you don't have to write uh, the indication of vibrato uh, because uh, that is a decision of the performer. Uh, if the performer uh, sees that uh, you are writing a, an expressive melody and that the melody uh, needs vibrato, he he will uh, he will add vibrato to the passage. Uh, so. Vibrato is produced by starting a rapid pulsation of the air column in one of four different ways. Uh, so the first one is by movement of the lips and show. Uh, this one is for the clarinet and saxophone. So you move your, your show uh, like up and down a little bit. Um, uh, well, so these uh, two instruments uh, can can use this uh, type of uh, of vibrato. Uh, in jazz music, you will hear uh, a lot. Well, depending actually on of the style of jazz, uh, but in saxophone players, uh, you can see how they move uh, the, their show, and you can see the, the vibrato clearly. Um, then the second type of vibrato is by movement of the throat muscles. Um, sometimes uh, flute players use this kind of vibrato. Uh, the third one is by movement of the abdominal muscles. Uh, these ones are for the oboe and bassoon. Uh, 
This is like when you sing a note and and you make the vibrato with your abdomen. So like uh, you make like little um, like I don't know how to say it. Um, well, yes, you you move uh, you 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 do movements uh, with your with the abdominal muscles. <clears throat> um, and well, the fourth one is by a combination of movements of the throat and abdominal muscles. This is the I think the most common one for for flute. Um, and well, so uh, this is just for you to know that. Uh, each instrument uses a different type of vibrato, and in the case of the saxophone, the clarinet, and the flute, you can use different uh, types of vibrato. Uh, the performer uh, uses one or the other depending on the music they are playing, if they are playing classical music or jazz music, uh, and also it depends on the character of the music you are playing. Um, and well, we already said this, but I, I repeat it. The orchestrator does not have to specify the use of vibrato in a score. Um, here uh, in the next uh, slides, I added uh, some, some passages. Uh, I recorded myself playing with the flute. Uh, different articulations so you can hear the differences but uh, I still have the the trouble with the audio and so uh, we we won't hear them now uh, but I will send you this um, this file uh, so uh, you can review some topic if you want and you can hear the the examples. Uh, the audio examples. Um, well, now let's talk about the tonguing. The tonguing is a, a topic related to articulation. It's like in the string instrument, we study bowing, and in the woodwind uh, instruments, we, we study uh, tonguing. Uh, uh, I mean, tonguing refers to uh, what the what the the players, uh, the different articulations that players do with uh, uh, using the tongue. Um, so, a tone on a woodwind instrument is initiated when the tongue touches the roof of the mouth and immediately pulls back. So here uh, we are describing what happens. Uh, with the tongue, when we articulate the the, the syllable ta, 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 there the tongue is uh, touching the roof of the mouth and is pulling back ta. Uh, so it is a, mm, a well-articulated sound. Um, uh, some players also in some passages use a, a, a slightly different articulation instead of ta, they say da, da, da is a little uh, like smoother articulation. Um, so here we have a passage uh, with no articulations written. Uh, so this is like the normal playing. Uh, they will play, they will articulate each note with a ta sound. So ta, 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 ta. There you can see that each note is a uh, well articulating, uh, articulated and starts with a T sound. Uh, also, here I wrote this like inverted triangle or kind of inverted triangle. Um, uh, that means uh, when the player has to breathe. That is not an, an official symbol. But uh, a lot of uh, uh, wind players uh, from all over the world use that uh, that same symbol. Uh, so, for example, when you are in rehearsal with the orchestra and you have to to write down uh, where you are uh, the, the place you have to breathe, uh, you put that symbol. 
so it is a reminder uh, of when you have to breathe. Um, I I wrote that to show you that, uh, for example, in the flute, in the in, in the flute, we can play uh, this passage if it is a quarter note equal eighty, because this means that each quarter note goes a little bit faster than a second. So this passage, in this passage, we have four, eight, nine notes. Uh, so it will take approximately seven seconds or so. Uh, so the, the flute player uh, can play this. Uh, but for example, if this was quarter note equal 50, uh, a flute player uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be able to play it because uh, the flute requires a lot of air. Uh, because when you blow, uh, there is uh, uh, the half of the air is uh, going inside the tube and the other half of the air, you are wasting it. <clears throat> uh, so uh, <clears throat> it wouldn't be possible to play this passage <clears throat> if you write a quarter note equals 50, for example, or 60. <clears throat> um, so the player... Uh, breathe and place all these notes and then he or she uh, breathes here again. Uh, now here we have a legato passage. Uh, you know what legato means, so uh, uh, here we see that there is a big slur uh, and so the player, the, the, the Goodwin player, only articulates, only tongues the first note with a ta articulation, and uh, he doesn't tongue uh, any other note. So it would sound like ta. See that the first one, I am attacking with a T sound, ta. And then you, the, the, the next notes are legato. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Uh, and well, here we have staccato. Uh, you already know all these articulations. Now uh, we are focusing on how to produce them on uh, on the Goodwin instruments. Uh, well, here it says when a dot is placed above or below a note head the player will articulate a short note with a natural separation between notes. So, uh, staccato, as we all know it. Um, I wrote this. This is wrong. This is what uh, what the players don't have to do. But uh, a lot of uh, beginners, when they, are, when they are learning to play the instrument, they see staccato and they think that they have to breathe uh, between every note, so so they do, bam, 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 and so they they get very tired easily. Um, so although uh, you have a staccato passage and you have uh, like a space between the notes, you don't have to breathe. You just uh, make a big mm, breath uh, before the passage, like bam, 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 bam. And there you breathe again. Um, so uh, this is uh, just for you to know that uh, if you hear, yes, tell me. Is there any question? I heard something with the audio. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, I, I heard something, sorry. Uh, well, so if you hear that uh, a player uh, plays in this way, he is probably a beginner, and just to know that uh, we don't have to do that. We, Although it is staccato, we take one big breath and we play the whole staccato passage. Uh, 
Uh, we have two more minutes. Okay, we can see soft tonguing. <laughs> uh, well, it says, with dots over the notes under the slur, the articulation is slightly harder than when dashes separate the notes. So here we have two different types of uh, soft uh, soft uh, tongue tonguing. Uh, they, they are actually very similar. Uh, this one is written with uh, dots uh, and with a slur, and this one are written with dashes and a slur. Uh, I will zoom it a little bit. So in the first one, uh, we have ta -ra -ra -ram, ta -ra -ra -ram. So the first one you articulate it with a T sound and then like a D sound uh, to make it softer. So you are articulating each note, but it's a soft articulation. Ta -ra -ra -ram. Uh, and well, this one is the same. It is just a, a very small difference. Uh, you can uh, hear the the examples uh, when I send you the the PowerPoint file uh, today. Uh, anyway, when you hear the the audios, keep in mind that I am not a professional player, uh, so. A, a professional flutist uh, will play better and uh, if you he hear something that maybe doesn't work uh, quite well when I play, uh, you have to know that a professional player uh, will make all these passages work uh, correctly. Okay. 